White. And I'm Avery Davidson. Thank you for joining us for This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, the only TV show bringing Louisiana farmers and consumers together every week. The water is coming, but when is still a question. Last week we spent a lot of time talking about the opening of the Morganza Spillway, which will flood more than 25,000 acres of farmland. The U.S. Army Corps of Engineers first scheduled to open the control structure on Sunday, June 2nd, then moved to June 6th. Now the official opening date is set for June 9th. The date keeps getting pushed back because the forecast keeps changing on when the Mississippi River would overtop the Morganza control structure. Federal regulations keep the structure from opening before then. This would be only the third time the Corps opens the structure since 1954, the year it was built. However, there's still a lot of backwater flooding all across Louisiana. Also, the Mississippi River continues to be at flood levels for a record amount of time, and hurricane season is here. Twyla's Neil Malasson takes a look at what all of this water means for the Louisiana Gulf Coast. Before you get to Morgan City, you get the first sight of the amount of water around here. Highway 70 is down to one lane, thanks in part to the water that's been around all spring long. It's a low point in the highway, but in town, you can see it's also surrounded by water. Were it not for this wall, everything around here would be under. Thaddeus Escort brought his family to take a look. He says it's the highest he's seen since the Morganza Spillway opened up for the first time in 1973. Years and years ago, uh, it flooded before they built the sea wall. Uh, the levee broke, and uh, I was a little boy at the time where the water uh, came up and had to take us out on boats. A barge has already been sunk in Bayou Shane ahead of the potential opening of the spillway to prevent more backwater flooding in parts east of Morgan City. The town also has gotten a couple of lucky breaks. First, the Morganza spillway opening has been delayed until at least June 9th. Second, the forecasted high has been lowered. The forecast for Morgan City has been dropped another half a foot. So now we're talking about nine feet in Morgan City instead of 10 feet, the forecast several days ago. But keep in mind, nine feet at Morgan City would still be the third highest level on record. Two of previous high records, 1973, 2011 the two times that they opened the spillways. The spillway opening is a dark cloud hanging over not only the city, but the low-lying areas around it. In talking with Ricky Gosselin, a sugarcane grower in nearby Iberia Parish, these canals have been full for months with or without the rain. Ultimately, the drainage in this area is affected by the tide. Whatever rain event we have, the tide has to work with us to get the water off our crops. And with significant amount of high tides during significant amount of weather events, we have a problem with drainage. From the ground, his place looks like any other cane field. From the air, though, you can see how close the brackish water is. This is the port of Iberia that connects directly to the Gulf. The threat of high water is a reality Gosselin has already seen. Kat Katrina and Rita was a significant event, both of them for, for our agriculture community. I mean, where we're standing now, we probably had four foot of water to the hood of this truck consistently for the whole storm surge, and it lasted over a three-day period. The spillway doesn't just threaten to flood land, it's also having an effect on the state shrimping industry. Louisiana shrimpers are having to go out further and further to find them, sometimes as much as 100 miles offshore. With the Bonacari open into Lake Pontchartrain, crabbing is down to as little as 10 percent of what's normal. All of these industries are holding on to a glimmer of hope that they won't have to open the Morganza, which Grimes says is a possibility. The pushback on the opening date has been because the big crest that they're expecting just hasn't arrived. And that's why I think we could see another delay because it's still slow to rise. And so as long as the water levels stay below that critical threshold point at the spillway for the core, they are probably, not probably, they are not going to open it. For now, the spillway remains closed, but the people who grow our food and fiber are under constant threat of it opening. As this washes down to the grocery stores, it might just start affecting us all. For This Week in Louisiana Agriculture, I'm Emil Lawson.
There are a lot of people under threat from all this water, and this is certainly a story we'll be keeping track of in the coming weeks. Thanks, Neil. Well, speaking of water, June 1st marks the official start of hurricane season, and we are already seeing tropical moisture in Louisiana. The good news is that there is no indication it will be a busy season. We asked LSU Ag Center climatologist Jay Grimes what to expect, and he told us it's a coin toss as to whether we'll see a major storm or not this season. Well, most of the experts are talking about something in terms of the total numbers in the Atlantic Basin that will be close to normal. Depending on what group you go, it's right around normal, maybe a tad below. But as we say every year, those numbers don't tell us anything. And here's the numbers that I like to tell people when it comes to Louisiana. There's about a 50-50 chance that at least one name storm will have an impact somewhere in the state. Now, that doesn't mean everybody's going to get hit. In fact, it doesn't mean that the state will get hit by a, a system, but 50-50 is way up there. In fact, when it comes to those kinds of numbers, Louisiana is truly a hot zone when it comes to tropical threats. Jay is a popular guy this time of year going to emergency operations centers around the state and filling folks in on what to expect. I remember my days working with him at WAFB for nine years. Really, really knowledgeable. We'll have a lot of Twyla extras with him that you can find on our website at twylatv.org. The Mississippi River is falling, but will soon be on the rise again. Near the old river control structure at the Red River Landing, the Mississippi River is currently just above 60 feet and expected to climb to 62.2 feet by June 14th. As Twyla's Craig Gotro explains, the high water is causing major issues for farmers along the river in Louisiana and may cause thousands of acres to go unplanted this year. The Mississippi River has been high nearly all of 2019. It's causing major problems for farmers who grow crops near the river. Where it hasn't rained for days, fields are still too wet to plant because of seepage water pushed up to the surface. Irrigation wells are backflowing into fields. Thousands of acres may go unplanted this year because of the high water. I know in Tensile we've got land across the levee, and they don't. the guys I've talked to that farm it don't even really envision planting it this year. In Point Capete Parish, the river has captured an area that typically grows more than 4,000 acres of crops. Because of the high water, farming practices have to be altered, and planted crops are beginning to show some signs of stress. The roots are starting to rot. Um, we're starting to see symptoms of that. Uh, any of the cane that is along the river, um, any kind of fertilizer application has to be uh, flown over. Um, and in a lot of fields just won't be able to be planted this year. Another slug of water is coming down the river and officials are planning on opening the Morganza Spillway. When opened, thousands more acres of cropland and pastures will be inundated, leading to additional hardships for farmers. If the water gets off quickly and the land dries, some farmers may try to plant again. We're reaching uh, kind of that threshold where we'll see decreased yields if they are able to get it in. Um, and you know, on, it's an unfortunate situation for the farmers because they have to tell the landowners that they're not going to be able to get a crop in this year. The high water has also displaced wildlife. Any wildlife that was across the uh, across the levee is now over on our side and they're they're hurting crops tremendously. Forecasts for most river gauges in Louisiana call for the Mississippi to remain above flood stage through June. With the LSU Ag Center, this is Craig Gotro reporting. On May 21st, Baton Rouge set a record for being above flood stage for 135 consecutive days. It's projected to be more than nine feet above flood stage on June 23rd. While the Mississippi River is high, many farmers across the state say it's been a bit too dry. Sure, the tropical moisture that moved in this week is welcome. For farmers hoping their late planted crops have a chance, it's all about timing and amounts when it comes to water. From above, you see dust flying into the air behind this tractor in Jim Harper's sugarcane field. This is in Rapides Parish near Cheneyville. It's dry here in sharp contrast to what Harper has experienced most of this year. This has been a tough planting season. Uh, we've got our entire crop planted now. We had about 300 acres of soybeans we had to plant over. These soybeans are in a field adjacent to Harper's sugarcane. Now, these are not his soybeans, but what he has coming up looks a lot like these. While looking out over his rice field, Harper's mind is on the weather. I'm hoping this rain that's forecast for the end of this week is not too much rain because it, it could affect them coming up. Just 30 minutes away in Evangeline Parish, 
you'll find standing water in Richard Fontenot's rice field. Normally, that would not be an issue, but while getting this drone footage, Fontenot told me water is not supposed to be right there. Water is, again, 2019 providing its own challenges. Uh, excessively wet, very small windows to put the crops in in a timely manner. Uh, we're planting beans substantially later than we'd like to, and, and unfortunately, we'll be, we'll be lucky to get 50% of our crop in due to the excessive rainfall and limited windows that we had to put a crop in this spring. Looking at his soybeans, the 50% of the crop Fontenot did plant is just coming out of some very dry looking ground. Harper says he has all of his crops planted, but Fontenot is only about halfway done planting soybeans. In fact, he stopped planting the day we shot that interview because the forecast said he might get five inches of rain over the next few days, and that's just too much for a newly planted, planted crop. I'm going to interrupt myself right here because I want you to know the difference just 24 hours can make. So I shot the interview with Richard Fontenot on Tuesday, June 4th. We shot our show on Wednesday, June 5th. Today is now Thursday, June 6th, and Richard Fontenot sent me this picture right here of one of his fields with four-day-old soybeans in it. He got about 5 to 10 inches of rain from the tropical moisture that moved in on Thursday morning. So it goes to show you how we can show you dust in a field one day and have an absolute flood and disaster just a day later. That's the kind of risk our farmers and ranchers take every single day. Now we're going to go back to your regularly scheduled Twyla so that you can see kind of how Kristen and her husband are dealing with it. Kristen, I know your husband Landon's been out there. How are y'all doing with planting? He, he finished up last Thursday. They, they had to do some replanting from earlier in the season where it was so dry. And hopefully the forecast say a number of he said one forecast said, you know, we're going to get a quarter of an inch from this rain that's coming today, tomorrow, and into the weekend. And he said some, his, his uncle might be worried that they're getting 14 inches. So hopefully we get a moderate amount of rain that's just enough because it, it has been really dry in our part of the state. Yeah, where y'all are over around Monterey, you have to worry a little bit about seep water as well. Do you, have you been seeing anything with that? Well, along, if you're driving down the levee on the way to Monterey, mm -hmm. all of those fields that on the other side of the levee, they've got quite a bit of seepage water. Mm -hmm. But I think that we're far enough in that it hasn't come yet. So yet being the operative word. Knock on wood. And clearly these news stories are changing quickly, more so than we can keep you updated with here on Twyla. So we wanted to let you know of another way that you can stay up to date on how the Mississippi River is rising and falling and the opening of control structures along the river. That's by checking our website, voiceoflouisianaagriculture.org. That's where you can read stories about Louisiana agriculture from crop progress reports to stories about the weather and markets that affect farmers daily. Speaking of daily, while you're there, you can also sign up for the Daily Voice newsletter to get all the latest headlines delivered straight to your inbox every weekday morning so you never have to miss a thing. Again, that website is voiceoflouisianaagriculture.org. Yep, 5 a.m. comes in every morning. This week, we finish our series profiling the finalists for the 2019 Louisiana Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award. We'll learn the winner during the 97th annual Louisiana Farm Bureau Convention held in New Orleans in just a couple of weeks. Philip and Carrie Tomlinson are fourth generation farmers from Lake Providence, Louisiana. As well as Carl Wigger shows us, everything about their farm is a family affair. Good job. Train up a child in the way that he should go. Pick it up. Good job. That proverb is true of how Philip and Carrie Tomlinson were raised right here in Lake Providence. For Carrie and I, everything's about family. You know, we, we, we live on the farm here. We raise our kids on the farm. Um, it's the same life that I grew up with, and it's the same life that I want my kids to, to have. I definitely grew up in the country with a country lifestyle, but not really knowing anything about how a farm worked or you know, knowing what it's like for our livelihood to come from agriculture. Where that understanding will come from for these children will happen here helping Philip water the corn crop. They'll also learn that here inside this sheep pen. Our kids get to experience things that kids that, that live in the city don't get to experience from raising these sheep to learning how to drive a side by side. They do learn that responsibility and are able to, to start doing these things and to see um, you know, the work that's involved. I always tell my kids that anything that you do requires work. And that's what's neat about the farm is that they, they see that work. When we get up in the morning, they eat and they 
go feed lambs before we get started with school. They go feed the chickens. They know, you know, that there are chores that have to be done and that those, those animals are waiting on them or they don't get fed. And so they know what responsibility looks like. Along with homeschooling their three kids, Carrie does her fair share of hard work from this office. Three years ago, almost three years ago, I started doing the books for the farm. The more detailed we are, the more that we can see where we are in relation to what the budget was and then also where we are um, on that budget and how we can make adjustments because in farming things are always changing. The Tomlinson farm has changed over the past decade. Sometimes they're last minute changes to overcome tough weather conditions or changing markets. But there have also been more intentional changes, like the way they irrigate and even the crops they grow. To be a fourth generation farmer and to be able to have grown up working alongside my dad and my grandfather and, and to see the things that they've taught me and to have their support and to have their wisdom and their years of experience, I mean, that's invaluable. Philip has really brought on a lot of that change and thankfully um, his dad is his 50-50 partner and he's just totally bought in and been, you know, completely supportive. All those things are, are challenging, but at the same time, they're extremely rewarding when you see that it actually paid off and that, that we do have a healthy corn crop that's growing and soybeans and just to, to see your hard work, you know, paying off. The winner of the 2019 Louisiana Farm Bureau Young Farmers and Ranchers Achievement Award will receive a $35,000 cash prize provided by the Southern Farm Bureau Casualty Insurance Company along with a whole host of other prizes. If you missed any of the stories about the other finalists, head on over to our website at twilatv.org and you can watch all of them there. Still to come on Twyla, the 2019 Louisiana Legislative Session is in the books. So how did agriculture fare? We'll hear the latest from there. And crawfish is still on the menu. We'll have a look at the prices coming up. Stay with us. I now hope they're fighting today. I hope they are. Find your place in the country and the lender who can get you there. Find Louisiana Land Bank. Financing for country homes, recreational property, farms and ranches, and agribusiness. Before you sweeten your morning joe, before the icing on the cake, before the sugar hits the shelf, it begins with a family of sugarcane farmers dedicated to growing Louisiana for more than 220 years. The Sugarcane Growers of Louisiana, making life sweeter naturally. Sugarcane, sweet sugarcane. I'm a farmer. I am a farm wife. I am a cowboy. I am a grass farmer. I'm a businesswoman. I'm a conservationist. I am an advocate. I am a voice for Louisiana farmers. I'm always learning. I'm a husband. I'm a mom. I am a dad. I'm a granddad. I am a consumer. I grow the food that feeds your family, and I'm proud of it. I am Farm Bureau. 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 We are Farm Bureau. The 2019 Louisiana Legislative Session is now over and agriculture fared very well through the session. And one bill that many of you are watching closely is House Bill 491 by House Ag Committee Chairman Clay Sheck Snyder. That's the bill that sets rules for growing hemp and the sale of CBD oil in Louisiana. Following a number of amendments in the Senate, the measure passed both chambers and is now on the governor's desk. Once the law goes into effect, the Louisiana Department of Agriculture and Forestry would set rules and regulate the growers of industrial hemp. 
Well, nearly 11,000 students in Louisiana are members of the FFA. You know them by their blue jackets and confidence in public speaking. Oh yeah, we always talk about how well-spoken members of the FFA are, but this week we get to show you a little bit more. That's because we were there for the beginning of the 90th annual Louisiana FFA convention. From the stage at the Randolph Riverfront Center in Alexandria, state officers shared inspiring messages with the members there to help them live the FFA motto, learning to do, doing to learn, earning to live, and living to serve. Louisiana FFA State President Brooklyn Hampton says this convention is all about the members. When you have 1,800 of them in one centralized location, it's a it's a party. We come here and we all share the same passions. We all like cows or we like plants or we are here to represent agriculture because that's what our association, our organization is about. And when we can do that together, it's a great time. One of the people who took the stage was William Gaspar Jr. Not only is William the state vice president for Area 3, he's also an intern here at the Louisiana Farm Bureau and a recipient of the 2019 Louisiana Farm Bureau Foundation Linda and Wayne Zonbrecker Scholarship. Hampton, who you just saw, was a recipient of the 2018 scholarship. So obviously they're doing something right with the FFA raising new agricultural leaders getting them prepared for college and scholarships, obviously. They, they are a very talented group of kids, and we're lucky to have one on our staff now. Yep, it's a lot of fun having William around, and we'll go ahead and we'll brag about our other intern, Lacey, as well. Lacey Dodson, who's sitting back there running the prompter to make sure I don't mess up when I'm speaking. Thanks, Lacey. We appreciate it. <laughs> in just a few weeks, we will be in the heart of the Crescent City celebrating the 97th annual Louisiana Farm Bureau Convention. In addition to the wonderful activities, food, and fellowship with friends from across the state, we will also be giving away some amazing prizes like the DJI Spark drone, the latest GoPro 7 camera, and an iPad. To enter, all you have to do is share your convention photos and videos on social media using the hashtag LFBF19. If you're posting on Facebook, Instagram, or Twitter, be sure to like or follow our Louisiana Farm Bureau pages as well. But just a reminder, make sure you adjust the privacy settings on all of your convention posts and your profile that weekend so that we can find all your posts online. We're giving away the GoPro on Thursday evening during the awards ceremony, so if you want to get a head start on entering, share a post as you're packing your bag or on the way down to with the hashtag LFBF19. We will also give away two sets of AirPod wireless earbuds during the social media conference, but you must attend the conference and be present in order to win. To find out more information about the convention, log on to our website at twilatv.org. Still to come on Twyla, something cheesy to make you smile. But first, a look at the crawfish prices. Stay with us. Landowners are minding the Louisiana forest for our grandchildren. A place for wildlife. Recreation. Lumber for homes. It's the right thing to do. Forestry. Covering half our state, all of our hearts. Louisiana oysters, salty, sweet, and delicious. But have you ever thought about what happens to all those oyster shells? Most of them end up in trash cans and landfills. The Coalition to Restore Coastal Louisiana is changing this with its oyster shell recycling program. And you can help by visiting these participating restaurants. It's a simple and delicious way to restore our coast. The shells will then be used to sustain and rebuild oyster reefs. Remember, once you shuck them, don't just chuck them. Every day across America, excess food is gathered by a network of good people at local food banks, giving hope to millions of children who struggle with hunger. They've earned their wings, and you can too. Together, we can solve child hunger. Support Feeding America and your local food bank at feedingamerica.org.
As we move into June, crawfish season is actually still heating up. A crawfish boil would surely be the way to spice up your weekend, or if you're looking for the perfect dish to eat as you sit back and watch LSU baseball compete at the Super Regionals, crawfish might just be the way to go. This week in North Louisiana, you can go to Ruston and enjoy crawfish from Ben Christmas Crawfish, where they have live crawfish at $2.25 a pound and boiled crawfish for $4 a pound. If you're in Opelousas, be sure to stop at the Crawfish House and Grill, where you'll be able to find live crawfish at $1.25 a pound and boiled crawfish for $2.99 per pound. If you're traveling south and find yourself in Thibodeau for the weekend, make sure to stop at the Seafood Outlet, where they have live crawfish at $1.95 a pound and boiled crawfish for $3.49 a pound. Make sure you shop around and find the lowest crawfish prices in your area before you buy. And as always, we want to thank our friends at the Louisiana Crawfish Promotion and Research Board, which reminds you to ask before you eat. You know what's kind of cool is you might not have to ask anymore now that the legislature passed the rule saying that restaurants have to post where the crawfish and shrimp comes from. Oh, okay. So you read before you eat, for sure. <laughs> I think that about wraps it up for this week's show, Kristen. Wait, wait. Oh. We cannot leave you guys without giving you a boost from the farm. How could I forget? Since June is National Dairy Month and we drink a lot of dairy at our house, two to three gallons a week, we have a pretty funny dairy-themed post to celebrate this week. Comedian Charlie Behrens hosts the Manitowoc Minute online, and this week he visits Crave Brothers Dairy Farm in Wisconsin to spend a day making cheese, milking cows, and messing around with some very expensive equipment, all in an effort to celebrate National Dairy Month. We hope you enjoy. Oh uh, yeah, okay, yep, you can't milk me, I'm a person. Hey dear Wisconsin, it's National Dairy Month, so I'm doing a couple two tree videos to show you why America's dairy land is on the license plates. And we're kicking it off with the green farm. But more on the green later, because I want to start by talking about the yellow, the cheese, well, I guess the white too. This is Crave Brothers cheese. You've read in the Bible about manna falling from the sky. Well, this is what that manna looked like, okay? Oh, holy night. This is cheese. It's buttoned up business. It's nice in here. It's kind of like a cheese sauna. Say it after me. Perlini. Perlini. Ovalini. Ovalini. I feel like I'm talking Italian now. With it, you are. This is mozzarella. You know mozzarella from all the good mozzarella cheeses, like uh, polcolini. Perlini. Perlini, and it all ends up here. The Crave Brothers Fresh Perlini. From the farm to my duck jacket. Would, would you? What? Hey, no, hey, how you doing there, guy? <laughs> Folks, we're about to enter the shop portion of the farm. What are we working on today, guys? Uh, we're trying to make the rain stop. How do you make the rain stop? Go inside. Do you ever just drive on here and, and sing uh, songs like, they think my tractor's sexy. You've heard of the stairway to heaven. This is not it. The reason you go down underneath here is to uh, change the oil in the tractor. Is that something I'm gonna do? Considering they probably want your tractor to work tomorrow, absolutely not. You're gonna crank her left, lefty Lucy, and she's dripping oil on you. That's how you know you hit the oil. You wanna leak her into a bucket, all right? Take the new oil and plug her back in. And that's how you farm. Is that about right or no? I can't believe they let me down here. Keep her moving. Okay, that looked like a lot of fun. I'd love to do it. I wouldn't be as funny. I can guarantee that. <laughs> so that does it for this edition of Twyla. Be sure to join us next week when we go from field to feast with Louisiana beef and crawfish. Until then, you can watch all of our stories online at twylatv.org, and be sure to like us on Facebook, follow us on Twitter and Instagram. For all of us here at Twyla, thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again right here next week.